Hello, you're listening to the State of Potentiality podcast. I'm Sarah, and along with my co-host Rebecca, we explore the state of potentiality, the idea that at any moment your life could change drastically, in turn giving you the opportunity to develop or become. Each week we interview people who have overcome challenges and use them to propel forward. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and share it with your friends so we can reach more awesome listeners just like you. podcast where we talk about what you do when life doesn't go the way you want it to. I'm here today with a friend, Levi Tatro. And now, Levi, I first connected with you or learned about you when I was working for a sports magazine, and you were on our cover. Yes, that's right. Yeah, back when I was playing for, for the Maroons. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah so you have quite the history in hockey, right? Which is, I mean, that's why we connected um, on and off. But did you always grow up thinking I'm going to play hockey? Yeah, ever since I was a young age, uh, I started off playing ringette. Um, probably around, you know, the four of us kids, actually. I got two uh, younger sisters and a younger brother, but we started playing uh, ringette and then eventually graduated on to, uh, to hockey. So that was always a sport um, from a very young age. I, I loved it for no particular reason. Like, you know, my dad, he played a, a little bit of house league hockey back yeah. in his day, but um, I wouldn't say it really ran in the blood, but it was just a sport that I picked up and, you know, ever since I was young, just, just loved it. Yeah, so your whole family plays sports, right? Like you're all athletic or yeah, you were at some point? For sure. Like more like, uh, you know, I played hockey, my brother did, my sisters were more into, like my one sister rode horses, horseback riding, um, dancing, you know, they did ballet and stuff like that. Uh, so it was more me and my brother that played the hockey, my youngest sister played hockey as well. Uh, but uh, we've all been very, you know, active in, in some yeah. sort of sport, the yeah. four of us growing up. Man, sure. sounds like a full-time job yeah, just for all chugging for sure. you guys around. For sure, yeah, I give a lot of parents, uh, credit to my parents for, for managing four of us kids like that <laughs> on a, a busy schedule like that. Like, uh, I can't imagine it, but uh, very blessed to have them. Yeah, so. yeah, they are fabulous people. So, you started, you were just playing local hockey, and then somehow you played with the Maroons. Now, what... Oh, I'm going to say all these terms wrong because it's been way too long. But so what l- level were you playing at when you were playing for the local Maroons team here? So, uh, yeah, so that was junior B at okay. uh, the local level. So I started off uh, playing in the minor uh, hockey system for the Cyclones, Chatham Kent Cyclones. Yep. Uh, played there all the way growing up. Um, then it was drafted to the Guelph Storm of the Ontario Hockey League in okay. the fourth round. Um, my 16 or 15 year old, that would be my draft year for minor midget. Um, and then spent the, my 16 year old year playing for uh, the Maroons okay. when I was 16. So that's uh, there and went to play two and a half years in Guelph. Um, went to Brantford when I was uh, 19 and finished in Leamington. Okay. Uh, the Flyers. There. So you've so, kind of been all around. So all around, yeah. yeah. To answer your question, yeah, Junior B would be the level of, uh, of the Greater Ontario Junior Hockey League is what okay. the Maroons are. So, yeah. Yeah. So. At what point did you kind of go, you know, I could probably take this further than just playing in Chatham? Yeah, well, like I said, it was a goal, you know, ever since I was a, a, a young kid to me and my dad and brother would go watch the, the Windsor Spitfires play at the, the barn and the WFCU center yeah. where, where they would play. And, you know, I remember at that time thinking I would love to, you know, play here someday at the WFCU center, uh, you know, play against the Spitfires, you know, you see the big arena, the fans and, and all that stuff. So I always had the goal of, of playing in the NHL. That was the, definitely my, my goal at that time to play. But, uh, you know, another dream of mine was just to play at the WFCU Center. So, um, you know, down the road, getting drafted, getting able to, to play and actually going now back to that same arena where I was on the storm playing against um, the Spitfires with my dad and brother in the stands watching. I mean, that was a pretty, that, that in itself was a, a dream come true yeah. to think that I went and watched, you know, when you're a young kid and now I'm playing with my dad and brother watching me play in the same arena, not with the Spitz, but against the Spitz. Um, you know, that was a dream come true yeah. in, in, in and of itself. So yeah. very thankful. Yeah. That, oh my goodness. That sounds amazing. So what was the thing that you liked the most about playing hockey? You know, some people say it's the fans. Some people say it's, you know, just this constant improving, what, what was your favorite part? What was your why? Like, why? Well, I've always, like I said, I've always loved the sport. Um, you know, I think the team aspect of, of being uh, in a team, and, you know, that's taught me a lot about life, too, in terms of playing hockey. It's taught me so much about life, of, 
of teamwork and you know I, I had the privilege of being a leader on most of my teams on you know two junior teams and my minor a hockey team I was the captain of, of that team um, you know so why I mean of course for the passion of the game I've always had the passion just enjoyed it thoroughly um, but you know being that community that you know any given year that it was me and the 21 year guys or whatever we carried up a roster about 21 players and the coaching staff that you know, it was almost kind of a, a family yeah. um, that you were with. And especially, you know, as I got older and more junior hockey teams and with wealth, you know, we'd go on the road, be away for a couple of days, staying in a hotel. You'd have roommates that you're staying with, you know, so it was a, a bond together. So it was the whole experience of playing and doing something you love, but having that family um, atmosphere and, you know, that every night you go out and you're playing, that you're playing for your brother, essentially that's you know your teammate yeah um you know so so that like i said i like the whole sport but in terms of team and life you know it taught me a lot of life lessons playing yeah. hockey that i'm thankful for to this day so so how old were you the first time you basically moved away for hockey yeah i would have been 16 so i played for the maroons um that year and at christmas time i got called up to the wealth to play about five or six games then so I was gone for uh, the Christmas break, about two, three weeks, something like that. And then at the end of that year, we were out in the first round, I think it was with the Maroons that year. So then I moved up to Guelph um, and played another five or six games and then kind of just toured around with the team. They went to, I think, to the second round of the playoffs. Um, so that was kind of, I wasn't away full time from home, but the second time after Christmas, I was away for probably two or three months. Uh, in Guelph. Okay. Um, so yeah, 16 would be the first time I, I really left. So. And what was that like as a 16 year old? It was definitely uh, something to get used to. That's for sure. Uh, I, I remember at the time I was in high school here at um, CK and I remember that was kind of a, uh, an issue because I had to transfer school, but I wasn't going to be in Guelph for that long to make it worth it. So I was very thankful that um, CK was very uh, they worked with me very well to do my school and I was able to actually kind of do it online while living in Guelph still so they accommodated so they were awesome to work with that way um, but yeah living at home I mean you go from living with your family that you've always known you know your brothers sisters uh, dads to, to moving in with complete strangers um, and my first billets they didn't uh, have any children eventually down the road my, my other billets did but it was definitely something you get used to, you know, you miss home and you miss, you know, your mom's cooking and just talking to your, <laughs> talking to your, uh, your parents on a daily basis mm -hmm. to living with a whole new family. So it was definitely took some adjusting. Um, but that being said, my parents, you know, are very loving and they call me and come visit, you know, every game and even on off days if, you know, I was, I was missing home, quite frankly, with being that young and, and living away. So it, it was, uh, I'm thankful for the experience, but it definitely was a time of adjusting to get used mm -hmm. to. Yeah, sure. and if I remember parts of your story correctly, moving away really made you decide if your faith was your own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I gave my life to the, to the Lord when I was, you know, a young kid, um, you know, growing up as, as many of us do in a uh, kid's camp or whatever at yeah. the church. Um, but yeah, I remember specifically when I went to Guelph, you know, having uh, this pressure, especially when you're trying to make... Um, the team, um, you know, and people, even people who aren't in sports can relate to maybe getting a job or, or the pressure that comes with wanting something that you, that you have to work for really hard. So I remember, you know, the stress of, of trying to make the team. And then once you're, you know, on the team in my situation that, you know, I was defenseman. So being that fifth, um, sixth defenseman, um, you know, at that stage, every practice is, is, uh, again, you know, you're always worried about the I'm going to be in the lineup tonight. Am I not going to be in the lineup when you're first there? So I remember and being away from home, uh, all that stress, you know, was, you know, it could be a stressful thing. But, um, you know, I remember being uh, in my room one night and, and really, you know, this was the first time that, you know, just crying out to the Lord saying, you know, I, I, I'm stressed out. I can't do this on my own. I need, um, you know, something more. And that was when I really gave my life to the Lord and, and said, you know, it's in your hands. Um, because it was physically taxing too. If we'd have workouts and we'd have to run laps around the stairs, um, you know, and I remember like my dad saying when I was really, really young that, you know, even in the times you might feel upset or not feeling, um, 
right that we're called to praise praise the Lord uh, at all times of your life, not just the times when things are going right. Yeah. So I remember you know, running stairs and saying, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord. And, you know, with each <laughs> laugh saying that in my head. Um, but, you know, my faith, like I said, it was really, that's when I, for the first time in my life, made the decision on my own uh, to give my life to the Lord, uh, in, you know, in wealth there. Yeah. So. so how did your life change after that moment? Well, you know, I felt peace. And like I said, I've always been, a, a, even before that moment, I've never been um, against anything biblical or anything like that. Yeah. But it was my first time that I actually, you know, surrendered uh, everything. You know, and, I, and like I said, I, I think the biggest thing that I learned, um, you know, everyone's story is different in terms of when they give their life to the Lord. You hear some people that it's miracles that, you know, it's, it's, it's this crazy experience. Some aren't. You know, I say for me that it wasn't just life. It wasn't just you know, something that blew up that was yeah. just a crazy explosion. Yeah. But, you know, I, I remember feeling so much peace and now, you know, it's out of my hands and that, especially that time, that even in my worst moments, even in the times when I don't understand and the pain, you know, I might not feel um, better, but I can acknowledge and praise that, you know, the Lord's in control of my life and he's in control of the situation. And, you know, no matter how I feel, whether I feel good, whether I even feel that like he's in control, you know, because sometimes... I don't feel like he's in control. I don't feel you, Lord. I don't feel anything that you're doing, but I have faith that you are good and that you are in control because your word tells me that you're in control. Yeah. So, so that for me, like I said, being in wealth the next two and a half years, I had my ups and downs, but knowing that, you know, in my moments of stress and worry and my good times and bad times that he's in control of my life and, and his will is going to take place. Um, you know, whether I'm bored or against it, it's, you know, the Lord's plan that's going to stand yeah. in the end. I love that. It's such a, it's a different, sometimes just a change of perspective, right? It can just change everything. Even though nothing has changed, you see it differently, right? For sure. Absolutely. So walk, walk us through what it's like to, you're playing in the OHL at this point and you're, you know, fifth or sixth defenseman. And so you kind of have to prove your worth, right? Yep. What was that like on a daily basis? What did your daily routine look like at that point? And, and like reminding our, our listeners that you're like 16, 17, 18 at that point, right? You're, I didn't have like anything together at that age. So, you know, it takes a lot of dedication for a teenager to work towards this, right? For sure. Um, and especially, you know, going through junior with the Maroons was, um, was very good experience. But when you get to Guelph uh, in that level of hockey, um, you know, you were expected to hold yourself at a very high uh, standard. You know, we okay. at our rink, we'd have four to 5,000 people there for our home games every night. And you go to some of the bigger towns like London at the Budweiser Gardens, and they'd have, you know, 11, 12,000 people. Um, you know, so you were expected to hold yourself to a high standard. We'd have, you know, autograph uh, signings and even just walking around the town, people would see a group of guys and know that, you know, that's the, the Guelph Storm uh, walking around. Um, so, you know, on a daily basis, you, you walk into the room and, and like I said, for me being in that uh, position as a fifth, sixth defenseman, there was some time you wouldn't know if you're actually even going to be in the lineup or not, mm -hmm. which I remember being very, um, you know, in hindsight, looking back, very kind of uh, stressful in a way, not knowing, you know what I mean, if you're yeah. going to be in or out. And, and like I said, in my situation, your practices were your games. If you have a, a bad practice or a couple bad practices, then the next guy's going to be in and you're going to be out. Um, so, you know, being a 16, you're looking back in hindsight and that was a, a lot of pressure and, you know, mentally sometimes that was, um, emotionally, you know, kind of draining, um, to be honest. But like I said, but that being said, you know, it, it taught me a lot about, um, life and persevering and, you know, I've always been a, um, a hard worker, a hard working guy. Um, but you know, other aspects of that, like I said, we, we'd have, you know, bus trips that we we'd be expected to be on time. Like, uh, on that note too, we'd have curfew, uh, in Guelph, you know, we'd have to be in our house at, at 10 30, um, every single night calling in on no the way. phone. Yeah. So we'd have to literally get on your phone, um, and, and call in that you're, that you're home. And if you didn't, uh, we'd have to run like eight laps of stairs. So, and you know, looking back, um, like I understand their, their perspective in terms yeah. of that, but you know, that was, it was, you know, it's unfortunate sometimes, I, I think, in my own opinion, because you got these young guys who, you know, I understand that you're being held to a, a higher standard, but at the same time, sometimes it felt like you're not allowed to actually live a, a life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's to a, to a 16-year-old boy when you think of it. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I completely understand you're, you're 
there to play hockey, you know, yeah. and that's your way why you're there. But at the same time, um, you know, sometimes 16 year old boys should, should be able to act like 16 year old boys and yeah. live like 16 year old yeah. boys at the same time. But, but like I said, overall, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity of being in Guelph and it taught me a lot about being a young man from a very young age and growing up quickly. So, so if I'm remembering correctly, you played for a team at one point that really was not doing well. Yep. What was, how does that feel when you're, you know, you're putting your best out there, you're working your butt off and you know, you lose game after game after game. And then the next practice, the coach is pushing you harder, right? Yeah. What, like, how do you not get stuck in a cycle of hopelessness? Cause I know a lot of sports and professional sports is mindset. For sure. Well, I think, yeah, like my two and a half years uh, in Guelph, especially, we were like kind of in a rebuild and like we lost um, lost a lot of games um, in, in that time. But I think for me, like uh, I've always had the, the mindset that you do the best that you can do. Um, you know, so for me, like I can't control what other people are doing, what, what my teammates are doing. I mean, I can do my share, but, you know, I can control me. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that my parents always taught me is that there's, uh, two things in this life you can always control and that's your attitude and your work ethic those two things so if you go to the you know and whether that's the hockey or your job or you know whatever it is if you go with a good attitude i can control that yeah i can control that hey today you know i don't feel good so i'm gonna be um moping around i'm gonna be in a bad mood you know but you're control that or i can yeah. choose to say you know i don't feel that good but i'm gonna have a good attitude i'm here to work or play hockey or whatever it is yeah. and then your work ethic i mean those two things you can work hard with you that's in your control to, to work. There's other things that are out of your control. Um, you know, so I think, like I said, and like I talked earlier is the whole team, uh, environment helped too. I mean, we were losing, it was frustrating, but you know, when, when you're in hockey and there's other team sports out there, not just hockey, I'm just talking about my experience, but when you're in it with a, with a family of brothers, I mean, even though we were losing, we had a lot of, you know, laughter along the way. And like, even now, I'll text a couple of my buddies that we went through it together and say, dude, like, hey, do you remember when this happened? Or do you remember when we were, you know, in the Sioux and this guy said this? And did? So you have these memories looking back now, that even though you were losing uh, a lot of games and it wasn't fun, um, it made a lot of good memories in hindsight. And like I said, for me, it all comes down to you can't control some things. You can't yeah. control, you can do your part. So um, even though we were losing, I tried to go, to the arena, do my best, you know, work hard, have a good attitude and, you know, leave it all there and what, whatever happens, happens. And unfortunately it didn't work out that year, but <laughs> it was a good uh, character building year. Yes. And, and yeah. you know, it was, it's funny to look back on. Yeah. Now, so. Hindsight is 2020. Yeah, it sure is. That it sure is, is. For sure. So you're in the OHL and you have, does every player in the OHL have a shot at getting to the NHL or how does that work? Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, when it comes down to that, you're, uh, you're all, it's all kind of in your control. Like I know I had a, a, some guys have agents that kind of vouch for them. Like I had an agent, um, when I played and the agent, like I said, kind of talks to the behind the scenes, the scouts, you know, the teams like that. Um, you know, so I would say, yeah, like every guy there, but you see guys that are even playing junior B sometimes that get drafted to the NHL out of junior B. I mean, that's rare, but it, it happens. So I think when it gets to there, it's, it's, in your control and kind of what you do uh, with it. Like I remember uh, I never did, but guys that I played with um, sometimes after games, when it got closer to the draft, there'd be um, scouts that were there that would inter- like talk to them after. So say the San Jose Sharks or the Maple Leafs or whatever, yeah. they had representatives there that would talk to guys sometimes that. Like I said, I never got an, an interview with one of those teams, but it was cool to, I guess, play and, and know that they were there. You know, even games that you might have met with an injury or scratched, but you're like, you're walking around and seeing like Toronto Maple Leafs or uh, Carolina Hurricanes jackets. So cool. It's kind of just surreal, just even, even if you don't talk to them, even if you don't um, ever get drafted or anything like that. Like in my case, I didn't, but I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Like, it's cool to just see that and just mm-hmm. say that like, you were a part of it and you were on an OHL team to be kind of in that in that inner circle. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a cool experience to see that. So, so did you... When did you realize that you weren't going to be playing for the NHL? Yeah, well, I think, like I said, it was a it was a goal of mine, and I was thankful to get to the OHL because that was kind of a goal within a goal was to yeah. get there. Um, but you know, as I uh, played and probably like my my second, like I was there for about two and a half years. So my second two and a half years, 
I knew that, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't going to work out. That being said though, it wasn't, uh, I didn't have a bitter mindset about yeah. it. Like I'm so thankful for the opportunity just to get there. Like I look at some of these, um, young guys, even now, I mean, just to say that you got drafted, I mean, the draft just happened the other a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, I look at, I, my heart goes out to some of these young guys that they work so hard and they wait on their couch and they don't see their name come up. Yeah. You know what I mean? It goes, not to say that's the end of the road. I mean, that doesn't matter really in the big picture, but for me just to say that I got drafted, um, you know, where I did and to go and play two and a half years, I mean, that's something that not a lot of guys can say. So I'm very thankful for that. But yeah, my previously second half year, I had a concussion. I got a bad concussion and kind of missed some playing time there. So going into my third year at camp, I knew that, you know, I was, they kind of had a talk with me and said, you'd be a fifth, sixth defenseman, that type of thing. And, you know, you might even be healthy scratch some games. So I knew at that point, like I wanted to finish my two years. I had left playing the game I loved, you know, and, go, and playing a lot and, and, you know, just playing what I love to do. So I went and played for uh, Brantford at that time. I was still going to school, but for the Brantford 99ers, uh, played there with the captain of that team for about two or three months. Um, and then once the school year ended, Brantford didn't have a, gr a great team. We weren't doing too well, but it was a blast. I played with a couple of my buddies that were from Guelph too that came along with me. Um, then I went, uh, requested a trade to Leamington okay. and spent kind of the last uh, half year there and the next year the full year there. So like I said, but I'm so thankful for the opportunity I've gotten and, and even going down like some of the most fun I've ever had playing hockey was my last two years in Brantford and in Leamington um, because you were playing more, you know, and, and for me, um, you didn't have as much pressure, let's say, as, as the OHL and you're always worried about fighting. You know, I knew that when I was playing in those teams, I play a lot of minutes, I play, get all the ice time I could ever want and just have fun. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think definitely God, looking back now, orchestrated that way on purpose, you know, yeah. in the fact that you start off playing the game you love. And then you go through a transition. Like I was still playing a game I love and I'm thankful for it. Um, but, you know, if I was to go on and play even pro and, and stuff and I look at my life now, um, I might not have enjoyed it as much as, you know, going, even though I was going down a level uh, mm -hmm. worldly, you'd say it was a downgrade yeah. for me in my heart. It was like, I'm playing a game I love. It's still competitive hockey. Um, you know, I had the chance to be the captain of a couple of these teams. Um, and like I said, that was the most fun I, I probably had in my whole career. It was my last, you know, two wow. years of junior. So yeah, yeah I was That's, very thankful. Yeah, it's such a cool perspective to have too, right? That um, you got to do what you loved. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you feel towards the people that you play with that are playing in the NHL? Oh, I, I'm happy for them. Like, um, you know, I, I've heard of people or I know some people that, you know, always might be bitter about that or, or saying that that should be me out there and like, I can't believe that guy like I played against him he wasn't that good and you know like for me um you know I just kind of touched on it like I'm so thankful for the chance I did get and I'm happy for those guys you know I, I'm not super close with anyone who is um in the NHL or pros by any means right now but uh, if anything I think it's just cool to say like I played with that guy you know, there's some guys even in the NHL playoffs this year mm -hmm. um, that I see on TV and say hey I got to play with that guy yeah. you know he was my roommate like way back when on this all-star tournament or, or some stuff yeah. like that so I got no like I said I know some people that have hard feelings and it's too bad in reality that you you know go through your life wishing that it was you and not them yeah. for some people you know but like I said for me I'm thankful for what I do have and, uh, you know, I'm happy for those guys and hats off to them. And it's just cool to say that I, I you know, I played against that guy, yeah. I played with that guy. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's good for them. Happy good. Guy. So you do some coaching and stuff now, right? Yep. So, yep. um, before we go into that, I just want to ask, were there, are there people that you can think of that really mentored you along the way? Like that really helped you to keep moving forward when when you didn't feel like you could, because the more I talk to professional athletes, and, and I don't a whole lot anymore, but when I, oh look, I'm, I have my Sports Express not the oh. players. Um, but when <laughs> I was great. doing that and interviewing these players, so many of them, the ones that I love talking to the most realized that it wasn't just their skill that got them to where they are, right? It was family, it was friends. My favorite interview that I ever did was with TJ Brody because he credits the town of Dresden for his success. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. he doesn't, 
I don't think I ever heard him say I'm awesome, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. That's been huge for him, and he's back in the community in the summers, and he gives back, and it's been really, really cool to be able to walk alongside him in some ways. Not that we're besties or anything. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, who do you give credit to? Yeah, well, I think obviously, first and foremost, like my uh, my parents would have to be, and my siblings too, and mm -hmm. like, it's sometimes it's not, um, in a moment, you don't realize it as much, but as I get older and be Come more mature as a man, you really realize uh, how much sacrifice by everyone, like not just my parents, but my, my siblings for having to sit through coming to the rink. Um, you know, with me and my brother, but more me, like playing a higher level, it was almost, you know, every other day that you were going, and my parents too, like uh, practices out in Bothwell or in Chatham or late night practices, and, and even like the financial side of things, how much money it is for the equipment, for, um, the cost just to play, um, you know, so first and foremost, like my parents, they, they gave, given everything uh, to me. And, you know, I hope to be half the parents that, that when I, you know, God willing would be one day for them, for all the sacrifice and to my brothers and sisters. Like I said, I bet you there was a lot of uh, nights that my sisters um, and brother didn't want to go to the rink, yeah. but they had to go to the rink because they can't be home alone, they're too yeah. young. So they have to go sit and watch their brothers, you know what I mean? Yeah. The sacrifices that they would have made that I maybe at the time didn't understand. Yeah. Um, you know, so my parents, first and foremost, all their sacrifices, uh, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to even get on the ice if it wasn't for, for them, the yeah. sacrifices um, they've made. Um, and then also, uh, you know, I've had some good coaches along the way. Uh, the one that always sticks out in my mind is Ken Gagne. Yes. He was the coach. Um, I don't know if you know who Ken yeah. Gagne, a chiropractor. Solid man. Yeah, yeah, great uh, man, and he was a great uh, coach. You know, he had our our Chad Kent Cyclones team about three years in a row, and actually we went all the way to the OHL uh, Cup that our last year, and had about six guys drafted uh, off our team. It was just a, a great Cyclones team to have in the town of Chatham. But Ken was a, a really good coach and a great man as well. Um, you know, so those are, and I've had a lot of good coaches on the way and nobody to really stand, stand out. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. is, is crazy, but definitely, um, the support of, of my family, uh, and, and, you know, Ken as well, being a coach really developed me uh, as a man, as a player, um, as a leader, you know, uh, all those things. And I think a lot of, you know, it's good to see. Um, like you were talking to TJ earlier and those guys that realize like and the town obviously for mine too the town of of, of Chatham growing up here uh, in Chatham Kent as well has given me a lot of opportunity yeah um, you know to play for for the Maroons and now come full circle and uh, coaching with the Maroons now and you know the town of Chatham has given me um, tons of opportunity and it's good to see um like you said, TJ and those guys that come back and, and realize that. Mm -hmm. And especially for TJ, you know, being an NHL superstar. Yeah. Like him, you know what I mean? He doesn't have to uh, to do that. Yeah. Uh, given, you know, what who he is. Yeah. Um, but it's awesome to see that, you know, he comes back and his hometown and his home roots. Um, you know, and I've met him briefly too as well. And, you know, talking to him, you'd never think he's no. he's an NHL player. No. You know, which, is, which is good, I think, in my yeah. opinion. You know, he's not no arrogance or nothing yeah. that you'd even... He looks like your average guy you'd, you'd see walking around town. So yeah. <laughs> we had cool. such a really cool experience. He did a signing for us when we had our one year anniversary. But everywhere I went, I'd be like, TJ Brody's coming. He'd be like, oh yeah, I saw him on the boat last week. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah. it was a big deal to kids because it's this NHL player, but most of the adults were like, okay, cool. Yeah, like, you yeah. Know, not a big deal. No, so that exactly. Was, that was a pretty sweet experience. For sure, for, for sure. So let's talk coaching. So you've had your hockey playing career, you um, you have a pretty good attitude about not making it to the NHL, I commend you for that, and you got to play two years of hockey that you loved, and so then at what point did you go, okay, yeah, I think I'd like to coach? Yeah, well, it was actually, so my last year uh, in Leamington, I finished playing, I would have been 20 years old, going on 21, um, and then I was always wanted to kind of coach or get involved in coaching of, of some sort, so I actually... Um, Started as a coach with the Chattanooga Cyclones, um, the minor uh, midget team. Okay, that so year. what age is that for those of us uh, that don't know? That would have been, that'd be your draft year. I think it was 14 okay. or 15. I, I don't quote, it's either 14 or 15. I know that uh, for sure. But um, yeah, so I started off with that uh, group and it was actually um, 
a local guy that was coaching like from around here that I kind of knew when um, Ken Gagne and his brother was a coach. Oh, Steve. Steve, yeah. yeah. And I've known Steve as well. Both I've known both those guys. So I yeah. met with them, and then so we so I was a coach there. Started off with those guys, and that was uh, really cool. And kind of just getting used to it, right? You yeah. spend all this time um, playing, and now to be a, a coach now, and now you're coaching guys on how to play, and you know what, whatever the details of coaching involved. Um, so that, that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then about halfway through that year, um, Tyler Rosler with the Chatham oh, Maroons, yeah. um, he took over from the team actually. He was he was originally a coach. He actually coached me when I was 16 yes, years old. Yeah. We went through, I think, two coaches that year. But uh, about Christmas time, he took over when I was 16 and coached. And then he was away with the Spitz um, as a, 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 a skills coach with the Spitz, that type of thing. So anyways, he came back and got hired as the GM uh, and coach as the Maroons. Um, and he sent me a text uh, saying, you know, um, heard that you're coaching with the with the uh, Cyclones and you know, we'd be wondering if you're interested in coaching with the Maroons. So cool. So that was really, uh, really cool. I remember I was um, working that day and, and so anyway, so I accepted and said, yeah, you know, that'd, that'd be cool. And uh, you know, for me, it was a really cool kind of once in a lifetime because you know, most of the guys that I was coaching now, I either played with or against the, the wow. year previous, yeah. right? Because I was in the league as a, well, I was captain of the Leamington team. We had a good team that year, made it to the loss in the finals to London. But so now, you know, the uh, guys I played with on the Maroons, you know, I played against those guys uh, the year yeah. before and now, no I'm on the, now I'm on the bench, you know, coaching yeah. them. So yeah. that was an adjustment, but a cool experience. <laughs> and same thing with Leamington, like when we go to Leamington, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, like my D partner I had all year was still playing. So I was coaching against him and all the yeah. other guys that are there, you're, you're coaching now on the bench. Yeah. So that was a really surreal experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and still is like, I, I love, you know, I, and so I still helped with the Cyclones and did that and the Maroons, you know, yeah. the schedule worked pretty well um, to accommodate that. Um, you know, and I'm still with the Maroons right now. We're looking at getting back on the ice here soon where things are starting to open up. Yeah. It's been a wrench, you know, with COVID and everything yeah. like that. But, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy uh, coaching and being able to share your experience, especially in a town uh, like Chatham. Like I said, for me to, to actually say that, you know, Tyler uh, Brazer, who's a great coach and yeah. like he's uh, he's the best, you know, there is when it comes to investing in guys and, and giving them opportunities and all that kind of stuff. So to have him as a coach and now be coaching with him uh, years down the road is a pretty cool experience yeah. so uh, I, I love it giving back to these the young guys and sharing my experience and being in the town of, of Chatham that you've grown up in uh, yeah I couldn't ask for better yeah those Rosler boys they're they're something yeah yeah oh for sure for sure <laughs> I've done some work with um Colin as well okay so yeah his name. Oh, Colin yeah 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 because he does a lot of um training with athletes and, and different things yeah who else who was he Oh man, now I can't remember the name. There was a goalie he was working with. It's been too long. Framemakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was working with just framemakers, yeah. and we yeah. did we did a show together for a while on the local cable station. Yeah. So solid, solid guys. I just found in my interaction with them, they were concerned about the athlete, but also the man or the woman behind. Yeah, you know, for sure. That sport. For sure. So, what do you take into your coaching? So, you've obviously got skill that you're sharing, but do you see it as I'm just sharing skills, or is there is there like a mentorship aspect to it? What is like, what is the kind of coach that you want to be, and and how long do you see yourself doing this? For sure. Well, I, I think being and, and same with Tyler, and that's you know when he took over the team when I was 16, um, being that younger kind of uh, voice, mm -hmm. um, I think does a lot, especially with a young group of guys, you know, and I can speak on experience of this, you know, I've had older coaches and nothing against them that they're bad, but, um, you know, I think when, a, like, say when Tyler came in uh, to coach me at 16 years old, giving a young guy that's in the know of, you know, the latest, whatever, hockey, even if it's just the language of the, like the hockey slang, whatever, yeah. um, he can really relate to the guys being so young and being so close to the time that he was playing. And, you know, for me too, it's the same way is that I think having, um, you know, a younger kind of coaching staff, not to say that it's better than another staff or anything like that, but uh, being so fresh out of the league that you played in. And that's what I noticed for me too, is to mentorship, not even just with the skills, but to share your, your experience of playing in the game um, and self and the mental aspect of it. Uh, you know, like I look at my, my journey and when I was um, 
playing hockey, you know, mentally, I think of all the adversity I went through of say, even the stress and some of that stuff, you know, maybe when I was playing, I didn't have the right ways of coping with it. Not that I coped in a bad way yeah. or, or anything, but I think for me, a lot of it, I maybe just let, um, build up or even like you make a mistake, let's say on the ice and you, can you, you base the rest of your game off of that mistake mm-hmm. instead of letting it go and moving on. And, and now, you know, so little mental things like that, that I might've carried when I was playing yeah. can help guys like that are, that are playing on the Marines now yeah. can help them and say, look, like I, and the same with Tyler is that when you have um, guys like myself and like Tyler and, and the staff that has been in that boat, that speaks volumes in itself that it's not, you know, just saying, well, here's what I think you should do. And, mm-hmm. And here's, you know, I'm not saying that it's, we give them the solution every time and that their problems yeah. go away. But, you know, when you have guys that played at a high level, uh, like myself, like Tyler, um, that you can relate to and say, well, look, man, I've been through what you're going through and here's what I suggest, or I'm here to help you, you know, mm-hmm. in that aspect. So there's definitely the, the skills part of, of teaching and coaching, but I think a big part of it too is, is the, the mentorship and actually, yeah. um, pouring into these young guys' lives. And like I said, Tyler um, does that in the staff he's created, that it's not just um, about the hockey player, it's about a person's, a kid's life that you care about. Yeah. And it's crazy the results you see from that. Like when you create a good organization, and you know, when I was playing in Leamington, it was the same thing. When you have uh, people that care about you and you feel like you're not just a number, you're not just a player that's there, but you're valued as a person and they care about your life outside of hockey, um, it's crazy, you know, what that speaks to the organization of what kids say about the organization mm-hmm. and how the team does when you have yeah. that. Cause I played on teams where it's not quite that family aspect. It's more like you, you like the guys, but you don't like everyone and the team doesn't really bond. And then I've been like on teams where like my last year in Leamington, I mean, we were a family that we do everything together and the results showed for it. I mean, we yeah. played every every night went to the finals that year weren't expected had the youngest team in the league or one of the youngest teams but it just goes to show that when you you care about each other as people yeah the hockey and everything else follows it yeah so yeah. so cool that's for sure so a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up but yeah. there say there's a 12 year old boy or girl listening to this don't know if I have any 12 year old listeners <laughs> but we'll see maybe yeah. we'll post there's something on TikTok or, or something yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're going, this is what I want to do. I want to play in the NHL someday. What is your advice to them? Well, I'd say for sure, based on mine, and I spoke about it earlier, is for sure to start with your work ethic and your attitude. I mean, you can only, um, you can control those two things. And especially your work ethic. I mean, when you, I know for me, when I was playing and for, and not just with hockey or, or um, well, all of life, and you can go home at the end of the day and look in the mirror and say, you know, I did the very best that I, I could then you have no regrets. You know, the worst thing is that if you go and you say, well, I wish I would have did this, or, you know, you're, you're always going to have something in your mind that you wish maybe you would have said something different or, or not made, you know, in regards to hockey, I wish I would have not made this play or, but if you say I tried, you know, what I gave, I had a good attitude and I worked um, hard and you know what, that's what I would tell, you know, young uh, people. And the reality is that it's not going to be easy. You know, no part of it's going to be easy and you're going to, um, you know, have your up times when you're feeling good. And I think the biggest thing is when you're in your lows uh, with hockey, especially and all of life, that if that's what you truly want to do to persevere through that, mm-hmm. you know, and if hockey doesn't work out, it, it doesn't work out. And it's ultimately in the Lord's hands. And you have that aspect of it too. Yeah. Um, but when you can look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, you know, hockey didn't work out for me, you know, I'm blessed that for me it did, but <clears throat> when you look at the mirror and say that I tried out everything I did, I had a good attitude, I worked hard, then you can say it just wasn't meant to be. Like, I'm, I'm frustrated, but it's, you know, if you were to look back and say, oh, I, you know, I didn't work as hard or, you know, I didn't um, have the commitment. Because that's another thing I would say, too, is that it, it takes a lot of commitment and sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you could still live your life, but, you know, I remember for me, um, you know, the off-season working out, even in season, like my parents built an ice rink, so we'd be on that all, oh, all the time doing that. Um, but it's it's a big commitment, and if if you if it's truly your goal for a young uh, uh, boy or girl to play in the NHL or to play a high level of sports, and it takes a tremendous amount of commitment. And those nights that 
um, you know, your friends uh, in high school might be going out to a, a party or going doing social stuff. That might mean you staying at home because you got to eat the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know it sounds cliche because people hear it, but it's just, it's true. And a lot of those things you, you got to give up if that's your goal. Not, not give up, I shouldn't say, but you have to just align your, your goals in order. And if it is to be in the a, a NHL or a high level of sports and to make those, those sacrifices, and it'll be worth it. But like I said, the two biggest things I would say is your attitude and work ethic. Mm-hmm. If you show up to the rink every single day with the attitude that I'm going to get better or I'm going to try to get better or focus on one thing to get better with a good attitude, no matter what the like, coach or anyone says, and you give it all you have, then you're, you're either you're going to have success, but even if you don't have success, you won't have any regret. You'll be able to, uh, you know what I mean? You, yeah. Even if you're not successful in that, that you thought you'd be successful, you won't have any regrets about it. You'd say, well, you know, it's not meant to be, but I tried all I could and I'm not sad about it. I'm not, you know, I might be a little disappointed, mm-hmm. but that's what I'd say. Attitude and, and work ethic, two huge things. I love that. How do you stop yourself from spiraling when you have a rough night or a rough play? And um, like, how do you stop yourself from letting that affect everything? And that doesn't just apply to hockey, that applies to life, right? Like it's so easy to get stuck. And so how do you help young guys now get through that? And, and what kind of tools are you giving them to keep moving forward? Yeah, well, I think for me, like playing, I kind of touched on it earlier, that was something that always uh, bugged me. And that's something that I struggled with, like looking back in hindsight, especially when I was, um, in Guelph with the pressure and stuff like that to play, um, you know, related specifically to hockey, when you make a mistake, um, that you stay stuck in that mistake. And, you know, then it translates to more mistakes in yeah. the end, you know, and, and given to life too. Like that can be the same thing, whether it's your, uh, you know, uh, work or, or whatever it is, your family life, you know, stuff like that, and mistakes. I think the biggest thing that I've learned when I look back is that that was such a, a toxic thing to live in your mind in terms of hanging on to mistakes. So I think the biggest thing now is that that mistake's a mistake and you let it go. And I know that's easier said than done sometimes. Um, But I think what's helped me and even now in life as I got older and mature is knowing that your mistakes are are teaching you to be better. When you have that mindset of it, like I look at my life and I think, okay, if I didn't make any mistakes um, and I did everything perfectly all the time, would I become a better person than what I am? Like, I want to be the better person that I can mm-hmm. be, whether that's my work or relationships or whatever it is. And if I don't make mistakes, then I can't be that better person because I'm not constantly growing. I'll stay stuck and I'll, maybe I'll be perfect. But I think now I'm looking back in hockey too, when you make a mistake, you can actually not say be joyful about it. Like you're still going to be a little upset, yeah. but at the same time, you can be happy in the sense that, well, you know what? I'm thankful that I actually made this mistake because now I know how to be better next time yeah. and more complete next time. Um, and with all of life and, you know, specifically we're talking about more hockey, um, and a hockey journey. So I would say, you know, for, especially like young, um, boys and girls growing up and playing, uh, you know, you're, you're going to get criticism too, depending, you know, I think the way the world's going that the, the old school coaching is, is out, you know, mm-hmm. uh, cause I had some pretty old school coaches that were just, just brutal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's not even the right word for it. You could say a lot worse, yeah. but just it's awful some of these, you know, uh, but the world, you know, but you're going to get criticism. You're going to get yelled at. You're going to, that's just reality. So it's not to say that it's never going to happen because it it probably will. But in those moments, you know, not to stay stuck in that, Mm -hmm. to move on um, in hockey relation terms, to just keep playing Mm -hmm. and don't let your mistakes, you know, stay stuck in your head because to, and in life too, because I think we've all maybe been there where you make a mistake and you can't stop thinking about it. And what happens is you end up, you know, just feeling sad or anxious the rest of the day. And, you know, you might end up actually making more mistakes because you're so stuck on that, the one you made yeah. instead of let, letting it go and, and, and moving on, which like I said, sometimes is, is harder uh, said than done. But I think, you know what, it, it, and if you already did make a mistake and you're stuck up on it and talk to somebody about it, you know, in terms of more like life talking, yeah. you know, and even like hockey and stuff like that, um, you know, in sports terms, like if you did make a mistake then talk to your coach about how you can, you know, not make that mistake again. Or what do I need to do? Like, I remember that when I wasn't getting a lot of ice time as well for, um, in Chatham or, you know, wherever it was that you talk to the coach and say like, look, 
I, I want to be better. I want to play more. What, what am I doing wrong right now? Or what do I need to work on um, to get more ice time? And I'd say for life too, whether it's a job or, or whatever, that if you, if you know, if you are struggling or wonder sometimes that, you know, keeping stuff in all the time and not mm-hmm. talking about it, it, it just destroys you yeah. from the inside out. You know what I mean? Instead of voicing your opinion and, and saying, you know, at the right time, it's to the right people, but talking about your feelings and how you feel and how you can get better. Because yeah. I think, you know, and I'm guilty of, of that, of everyone, uh, you know, I'm getting better, but you know, something bothers you. It, it's not going to do any good to, to leave it inside of you. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, like pent up and it builds up and it still bothers you rather than, you know, talk about it, get yeah. it out in the open and how you can get better that way. So, um, yeah, that's kind of like the advice yeah. or how I go about it. I have, so I work part-time for radio station and I had a, my first gig in forever yesterday because of, you know, lockdown and stuff. And I got so much good feedback from my manager and my boss, and, but they both noted one thing that I need to do, not that I did wrong, but that I need to do better next time. And I'm so appreciative to work at a place where they give feedback, right? Like I never have to wonder how I did. But I'm stuck on that one mistake and I got to be like, now I just feel like I need to go back on air so I can fix it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Well, I'm the same way you get hung up, but you know, it's a, and I think in my opinion anyways, for me, like it's, it's kind of a bad mind Like you want to be the best person you can be, Yeah. but you know, sometimes we can set, or at least I myself can set unrealistic goals with myself that, you know what, I got to look in the mirror and say, I'm, I'm the farthest thing from perfect and I'll never be perfect you know I'm always yeah. going to be making mistakes I'm always going to be um, learning yeah so I think sometimes for me I, I know exactly how you feel it. you make uh, one little mistake and you're hung up on it yeah and you, you can't stop thinking about yeah. it and then you think back of, of what would I have done differently and what but you know I think it's good to to an extent to go back and say okay look I'm going to learn from that and you know what I should have did this better yeah you know and face that reality so I think it, it's not always harmful to look back to a degree on, on mm-hmm. the mistake but then you can get to the point where you're hung up on it and it's yeah. two weeks later and you're still thinking of this little silly mistake yeah. and you'll look back, you know, a lot of times for me anyways, I look back in even a year and think like, I can't believe I was so hung up on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? In yeah. the grand scheme of life and the grand scheme of, of everything going on around me, it was a little yeah. issue that bothered me, but I, I know how you feel. Like yeah. said, it's a lot easier said than done sometimes. But I think the important thing is to not get discouraged when you make the mistake. Like for me, I'm going to go, the, I don't know when my next radio shift is, but the next time I'm going to nail that piece. Right. Yep. And I'm going to get it right. And so for me, I don't have the opportunity to go and fix it tomorrow, which is the frustrating part for me. But if you're in a sport or you're in a job or if there's a situation where you've messed up, just you have to be so careful not to let that define your next step, right? Yeah. Like, um, just, you have to keep going and improving. And, and there's such a, I think the psycho babble term for it now is growth mindset, right? Like yeah. just whatever you're doing, you're going to mess up. Nobody's perfect, but you got to learn from it. And, and the people that I'm talking to on the podcast often are people that made a mistake or came up to a challenge and instead of saying, well, this is the end, I said, well, this is the end of that. Here's my jumping point for the next. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's been a really, it's so, I feel so fortunate to sit with people and just hear their experience and what they've taken from it. So I really appreciate you taking the time. It's oh, been lots yeah. of fun chatting. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that you are also a musician. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And you have the country twang. Yeah, I, well, I try. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, no, I've always loved music. Like we've been in a singing contest. Like my dad uh, sang, like uh, he'd go in comp- little, no comp- way. yeah, like little competitions, yeah, you know, yeah, around yeah. the comber and stuff. Yeah, and I think no, he, he might've actually had a band way back when he, <laughs> he has some old pictures. Uh, I'm whatever. learning something new about games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, anyways, but yeah, we'd always, it's more me and my, uh, the oldest sister, Sarah, she yeah. lives in North Bay. Okay. Uh, the other two, they, they, I don't think. If you ask them, they're not much singers, but they still like, we'd always go in a family. Um, we'd go to Calmer and sing as a family oh, and, nice. and stuff like that. But it was more me and her that took more to singing than the yeah. other two, you know, yeah. the, the music just wasn't their thing. But uh, yeah, I've always loved music. And actually, yeah. I, I, I'm i thankful. Another thing in Guelph is when I was out with my concussion, I self-taught myself the guitar oh, cool. on, on YouTube and how to, you know, finger yeah. picking and just the basic chords and all that sort yeah. of stuff like that. But no, I, I love, you know, music and 
at, you know, any kind of just playing the guitar and it's such a great um, stress relief yeah. for me. You know, uh, I usually do it every day, not for anything, but it's just enjoyable and yeah. mentally, you know, I mean, just to play and, you know, try writing songs or, uh, or playing songs. So yeah, yeah it's really good. I, I remember it. the first time you sang at church, you opened your mouth and it just, your voice sounded so different than what I had <laughs> like pictured in my head. Cause I, I love music my whole life yeah, and done yeah. different things. So, like it took, took me back for a second. I'm like, oh, wait, that actually sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if it's, um, like I, I've always loved country and like, yep. I guess want to, to sing like a country singer, yeah. but it's not like a, that's just how I sing now. So I don't know if it was, uh, it wasn't like I had to force myself to try. <laughs> so I don't, like I said, I can't really say how that developed. Maybe it just between that's just listening on the radio yeah. and thinking in your head and then actually singing, <laughs> but it's not like I took lessons for it, but hey, yeah. you know what? I just yeah. like music for my own mental yeah. um, health and, and just to do it, it's, it's a yeah. lot of fun. And you so. have a, do you have a YouTube channel? That you uh, yeah, I do have a, yeah, a YouTube channel that I usually put songs. Uh, I've been playing around a lot with uh, GarageBand okay. these days now, and actually I'm, I've been playing around now with, uh, I downloaded a drum kit. Oh. Uh, so the, I actually go on my phone and can like play drums and stuff. So I've been, anyways, I've been goofing around yeah. with that and stuff uh, okay. like that. But yeah, I have a YouTube channel. I, I put them on and always want to do that kind yeah. of stuff. So uh, yeah, nice. it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's good. And it's, I just wanted to loop that back to, um, it was because you were in sports and you got a concussion that you picked up a guitar, right? Like yeah. you still, even though you were out with a concussion, you were still finding things to do. For sure. And um, I know music, I, originally when I finished high school, I was thinking of going into music therapy because it's so healing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And it, I mean, it's for, that can be playing piano in a senior's home, that can be teaching piano lessons. Some kids... Um, learn an instrument for dexterity, you know, different things like that. So music is just such a healing thing, whether you listen or you create or you share, it's just huge. And so I think it's so cool that that was something you discovered when you couldn't be on the ice. Absolutely. Yeah. And to touch on that too, I, I agree too, music does, and it doesn't mean you have to play an instrument, like you, whether it's listening, whether it's, it is playing a, a tambourine and you just hit it because yep. you like the sound of it, like, you know, yep. whatever that is. But I think, um, you know, especially like for young people, you know, I've never been, we always lived, grew up in a country, so never been much into video games and stuff. Not, not that it, I think in moderation, video games are okay and yeah. stuff like that. But I, I think for younger people too, it's a, it's very healthy mentally music in general, you know, in a great way for me, like I said, I'm thankful that it developed a stress coping mechanism was yeah. to play music. And I think, you know, rather than, um, maybe we'll sit and watch TV or uh, play video games. Not that those are bad things in moderation, yeah. but I found for me, for music and stuff, it wasn't, you know, it's was very filling mentally. Yeah. And, and not just like, you know, I, I understand people have different, but I would encourage people to find, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, maybe hiking outdoors, whether it's, you know, those healthy yeah. uh, coping mechanisms that are healthy mentally for you to do. Yeah. And there's so many out there, you know, music's just kind of what I do, but to, to find, you know, what, what works for you and what you like. Yeah. So. I found this quote by Jefferson Bethke, and I'm sure he got it from somewhere else, but he said, you were made to create more than you consume. Yeah. And that's one that stuck with me, whether that's, you know, going on a hike or creating art or creating music, or for me, I love to go out and pick flowers and make bouquets, but just this idea that creating something is therapeutic. Yeah. It really is because it's what's inside is coming out. Absolutely. You know, whether that's taking a friend on a hike and showing them something or writing a song or just learning to play an instrument or painting or whatever it is. It's just, I have found in my life that my mental health is at its best when I'm creating something. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you're accomplishing things too, like it gives you a sense of uh, accomplishment and something that you're working you know, towards, mm -hmm. um, rather than some of those other mechanisms you might do. Like, yeah. you know, when you like if I was to compare, let's say watching TV for an hour compared to going out and doing, you know, something, um, like hey, golf balls, let's say I like to golf or, or hiking or, you know, those, those are just my things I like, yeah. you know what I mean? But I take those things, I I, I don't mind watching TV or a hockey game, and, you know, I'm not yeah. saying those things are evil and bad, no. don't do them. Yeah. But I find for me, like being out in those reward, you know what I mean? Mentally being outdoors or, or creating things, um, you definitely get that fulfillment. Yeah. And uh, it's just different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, 
That's good. Very cool. Well, Levi Tatro, everybody. Thank you so much for being oh. on the podcast. So appreciate it. And um, we'll put your YouTube links and your social media links or whatever else you want up on the show notes. Final word? No, I just want to thank you uh, for having me on, on this uh, podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we uh, got to talk and yeah. have some uh, conversation. So I'm very thankful. Hockey slang 101. Okay, so you give me a word and I'll try and guess what it means. All right, got some up here. So I'll start off easy, I guess. Maybe uh, an apple. You know what that refers to? The puck? No, good try. <laughs> uh, an assist. That's oh! Cool, uh, an apple, yeah. Okay, why is it an apple? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but that, that's an old, like, I, you've heard that one for a while, or I have. Some of these are newer, some are uh, yep. older. Um, biscuit. Okay, use it in a sentence. Um, like, pass me the biscuit. Like a puck? Yeah, puck, okay. you got that right. one. Um, I'll my guess see. every time. Um, celly. Oh, goodness. There's like, that guy, had a, that guy had a really good celly after that. Celebration? Yeah, celebration. Okay, isn't there like an alcoholic drink that's called that or something? Um, yeah, it could, it could be. It rings a bell. I, don't know, I can't think that's, of it. That's our mind. Selly, <laughs> my mind was <laughs> <Sally>, yeah. <laughs> it probably somewhere in the world there's a yeah. thing called Selly. Like, so. I'm going to Google this. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, dangle. Oh, okay, my husband has used this one. Like that guy got dangled. So like yeah. they really like... They got the puck around them? Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's close yes. enough. Yep, dangle. Um, duster. Ooh. Can you use it in a sentence? Yeah, like that, that guy's a duster. That's <laughs> what, what you'd say. No idea. It's just like a, someone who's not very good or like doesn't get a lot of playing time. Like, like a duster, like not, not like, a very good hockey like player. Like somebody that's a maintenance worker. Yeah, yeah, it's like a duster. <laughs> yeah, like an actual duster, I guess. <laughs> it's say, maybe. So you don't want someone to call you No, you don't want someone to call you Okay. Not, not, definitely not a good thing. Um, a gong show. So, like, it went really badly? Yeah. Like I, a game gets out of control or... Um, yeah. You know, so is that like like if the team railroaded the other team? Yeah, yeah, or just even it turns into a mess. Like there's there's fights and scrap, like people okay. fighting. Like I guess yeah. that's another one. I just said uh, a scrap. So that's fighting. Yeah, like fighting. Like, like, that's, like, like just, fists come out. Yeah, yeah, like a fight, like a fight, a scrap. Like I guess okay. I just use that one without even trying to use it <laughs> right now. So there you go. Um, a muffin. A muffin. Yeah, like that guy. That shot was a real muffin. Well, I like muffins, but that sounds negative. Yeah, it, it is negative. It's not like a, it's not a good thing. It's okay. Like so is it like just that shot sucked? Basically? Yeah, like basically the shot was the. Why like muffin? Fluttering though? shot, or I, I don't know where some of these uh, <laughs> come from. I really don't. Um, a few more here. Uh, a yard sale. Cheap shot. Um, not really. I'll give you another guess. Okay. Uh, it's not like a cheap shot. Like, um, that guy really got yard sale, I guess, what you, how you'd say it. Somebody, like, steal a puck from him? Uh, you're kind of getting closer, but it's like when a player gets, like, like hit really hard and, like, the gloves fly off and the stick flies oh. off the helmet. But it looks like a yard sale, I guess. It, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And he lost so much equipment when, yeah. he, when he got hit. <laughs> That type of thing. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally gonna use these next time I'm watching a game with Trevor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah you have to, well, he probably knows most of these. To be yeah, honest. he probably he, does. He would be better. Uh, a sieve. Is that referring to a goalie? Yeah, yeah. So the goalie just really couldn't stop. Yeah, anything? he could stop. Yeah, like a sieve. Yeah. He's, Man, he's I'm not as bad sport. at this as no, I you're thought not. I would no, be. No, no, you're, yeah, you're getting better. Uh, sin bin. Sin bin. Oh, I have no clue. Is that a sentence? He, uh, he, he took a trip to the sin bin. He's off to the sin oh, bin. Oh, um, um, penalty. Yeah, penalty box. Penalty box, yeah. Um, I think he heard that. A couple. Light the lamp. Let's go out there and light the lamp. We're gonna light the lamp tonight. Like, just light up the other team? Yeah, like scoring a goal. Yeah. Light, light the goal. Oh, lamp. right! You know, the, oh the, my lamp, God. the lamp, the lamp. So stupid right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, 
Actually, were you playing for the Maroons when they had their super fan that had the hat yeah. with the light? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chad, I think was Yeah, his Chad name? Peterson, yeah. 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 I think he still goes. Uh, for some reason, I thought in playoffs last year, I didn't see him there as much with the red. Oh, okay, helmet. yeah. I'm not sure, but yeah, he'd always go there with the red. Yeah, that was one of the memories of playing at Chatham or going yeah. to Chatham. Was yeah, that. yeah, super fan. Is that, yeah. That's right. Um, you want to do a few more here? Sure, let's okay. go three more. Three more? Okay. Um, let me find it. Uh, lettuce. That guy has some nice lettuce. Hair? Yeah, yeah, you got it. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not really a hockey related, but it kind of is, but you got it. Okay, let me see uh, two more. Um, okay, I'll try to do some uh, flow. I got it. That guy has some nice flow. No idea. Well, you, you're close on the, your last guess there. You stay along those lines. Like, like hair again? Yeah, hair. Like, like long hair. Like, okay. Some of the guys have the long... Wouldn't that be like super... Is that not super uncomfortable with the helmet to have long hair? No, not... I had it like uh, off and on. Sometimes I had long hair like playing, but I didn't notice it that much. No? Like it wasn't... I mean, I had weird. really long hair and I, I was just always very... Like, yeah, I, I never... Like I never really let it go past my shoulders <laughs> or anything like that. But it never, it never bothered me that much. Um, okay. I'll, the last one I'll say, uh, Gino. Gino. Hmm. What a Gino that was. Or... Is it negative? Uh, no, it's not negative. No. No idea. Uh, it's just a goal. Like I like someone scored like really? a goal score like a Gino. What a Gino that yeah. was. Yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I learned so much new. So if you didn't know anything about hockey. Just like, now the next time you go watch a game, use any of those terms, and when someone asks you where you got it, you can say it was the state of potentiality podcast. <laughs> you just listened to the State of Potentiality podcast. You can find all the resources we discussed in the show notes, as well as our social media links and more. If this episode resonated with you, subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and share with your friends. Tune in next time as we continue to explore the state of potentiality. It is what it is. It is what it is. What What will you do with it? it?